online. Uh, thanks to, for, to Jana Jovan for some slides, to Marco Punta, who is now at the ICR in London. Sorry, can you switch off the light? Yes, we can switch off the light, uh, but it's only these few slides. Uh, okay, you have to really, I believe the point of this slide is the coconut. Uh, Marco Punta just happens to love coconut. This is a coconut for those of you who have not seen that. Uh, and thanks to Abner Schlesinger, who is now at Mount Sinai in Kars uh, the New York Genome Center. Brief introduction into function. Some people have done the last semester's lecture, so there is going to be a change of speed on this one here. If, you, if I'm too fast, stop me. If you don't stop me, I'm going to speed up more because some people know it. Basis of life. What did life start with? This is the idea of this primordial soup that was probably struck by lightning or something, and then the first proteins. So the br br just, uh, lightning is essentially it's energy, right? It's energy, yes. There mm -hmm. was energy, and for some reason, I think this is still debated, is that for some reason something was able to replicate itself. And yes. and what is that something? That, you know, there are biological, uh, um, in biochemistry there are structures that were capable of moving through the soup, and while they move through the soup they produce more of themselves. Exactly. What are they? Uh, the yeah, that's the idea, right? This is essentially exactly the idea. Uh, so Eigen did the experiments, Tom Cech sort of had the, the initial idea, Walter Gibbet sort of got the information idea. Really, RNA is the thing that sort of is in this primordial soup and replicates itself and actually creates something that is sort of long-lived, DNA. Uh, on that very, very issue, so we're talking about short-lived RNA, long-lived DNA. RNA is short-lived, what does it mean? So if I, if I just throw RNA into the air, will it get to you? Short-lived, that short that it doesn't get from me to you, or? Well, first of all, it depends because I also think that there was RNA that could live longer. So yeah. certainly true. So I'm, I'm completely losing the topic of, of history now. Uh, all is that in terms of history, I said there's a short-lived and there's sort of a long-lived. Yeah. You're absolutely right. There's RNA that lives much longer, in particular in the body. So we, we have tons of RNA that essentially live as machineries in uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, rhizosomes, so for instance. So we are producing proteins with a machinery that is partially proteins and partially RNA. They are there all the time, essentially. So yes, RNA can live much longer, but I'm talking about freely uh, RNA sort of whizzing through the air, which is slightly different. Again, there are RNA molecules that are more stable than others, absolutely true. Uh, but is RNA short-lived on the scale that I can get it to the back of the room? You're kind of taking it out of its environment, aren't you? Yes. Mm, yes, but there is, so we'll be careful. RNA is, is in the room, okay? RNA is in the house, and, and this ultimately, I mean, one example is the viruses. Uh, there, there are tons of RNA viruses that are in the air at this moment, and that are sort of moving around, so the probability that I get it to the other side of the room is much lower than that I get it closer. That's why the infection of viruses is higher in the proximity. If you get contact, it's even higher. But in, in the survival in air is relatively short, so to get it to the other side of the room is unlikely. But with a particular sort of wind or something, it could happen. This is sort of the time scale. Now, what about the time scale of DNA? Again, there are DNA viruses, they are also in the air, and that is in fact why they are sort of more, more worrisome, because they live longer. But how long do they live? But, so, but the viruses don't they have like a protective hull? They so, do so have. So if you were to like, grow like completely... Just so now that's the point. Um, let's just stick to that issue. So I'm going to write on the whiteboard with this marker, and I'm going to... Oops. Well, the idea was I throw the marker to you. Right. Uh, so there's some of my DNA on it. Right. Now I throw it to you. Uh, and it gets some of my DNA. And you're going to write with it. Okay, now you take this marker into your pocket. You carry it home. Okay, being poor, you're not a nice guy. So you're going to hit the guy. Okay? You're going to hit the guy with, uh, with your telephone. <laughs> So you, you, you're gonna. Uh, we, we have the crime. Paul attacks uh, some some professor with a telephone. Hits a professor over the head with a telephone. Okay. Now 
the DNA of me, can that be found on the victim? That's the question. So all the tr transmission that happened, direct DNA, no carrier, right? I have the DNA on here, I give this to you, you put it into your pocket, you've touched it, then you've touched the phone and you hit the guy. Is there a DNA for me on that? It's a yes, but there will be, you can tell that it has traveled a lot. That's my answer. I believe you're right. And so surprisingly, at least at this point of forensic, the, 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 detail, the level of detail with which we can read DNA, we can really detect these minute quantities, and we can in fact detect that. And the question now becomes, how long does it actually travel? And they need, at this point, forensics needs to have better experiments they do not know. So there are incidents of this kind of thing, where somebody found some DNA of somebody else and the claim is that person was not there. And there seems to be evidence that's really true, the person was not there, so how can it happen? And so what they essentially now need is sort of large-scale studies about how, how much can DNA actually travel between people, yeah? I mean, could you just restrict that based on the amount, like somebody were So that's high probability. <laughs> Ultimately, this is the point, but the amount also has to do with time, so it digests over time, right? And it has to do with how many other people you see. So do we have little because the connection was so, so low, so because they're not direct, or because uh, it's so long ago, it's difficult to say, right? And with the degradation of the DNA. Again, this is ultimately time, right? <laughs> the degree of degradation is proportional to the time. But it's, it, it, so the degradation is somehow proportional to the time, or is it proportional to the number of jumping points, right? It's it, proportional to the amount of DNA you had in the beginning. It's, it's a variety of things. But how much of that is actually possible? And that brings us back to this question, how long lived is it? And it's, it's, it's not. Let's give another example, uh, another extreme example. So you dig in the ground and you find a bone uh, of a human. How long will you be able to sequence the DNA? For millions of years. Millions of years is, 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 is darn long. But in particular examples where it's sort of sealed like dinosaurs, we, we sort of can do that, but only sealed. Uh, bones are typically not sealed. Uh, so, for instance, to determine the genome of Neanderthal was a major problem in the beginning. There now is a sequence of the Neanderthal available, but the challenge really was it to get clean DNA material. And that again has to do a lot with digestion of, of all kinds of creatures, bacteria and, and, and other creatures. And pollution of human, actually. That's a story in itself. Maybe I, I stopped 10 minutes before. It's a totally cool story. But anyway, so on that scale, uh, this is what short and long means. DNR is a lo DNA is a long storage mechanism, and in the, but in the RNA world, RNA essentially is the driver. It's an RNA world. Now, the problem is that in this RNA world, do not all the enzymatic activity. RNA can do. RNAs are acting as enzymes. Again, those are the ones that are sort of more long-lived inside of cells, but they cannot do all enzymatic activity levels needed in, in order to sort of have this entire cascade of events, have this circle. And for that, they need proteins. They enslave proteins. Now, if that would be the case, if RNA enslaves proteins, uh, then you may suspect that the proteins that we have today are somehow still showing that there was a that they at some point were slaves. So what you would assume is that RNA looks for peptides to do enzymatic reactions, then the peptides it finds are, are sort of subject to the condition that they should bind RNA. That means that we should be able to look at today's protein structures and see that they are highly biased toward binding RNA and DNA. And this is essentially the idea of André Lupach at the Max Planck Institute in uh, Tübingen. And ultimately what he's trying to see is for particular protein structures that we know from today, what is their history, and is it true that at the core of these there is a unit that essentially binds RNA and goes back uh, billions of years to the origin of life. <laughs>
So that the world of the proteins has been shaped by the fact that coincidentally what we have, those 20 amino acids, those proteins, are the ones that bind RNA. That's simply the historical beginning. And that created the world and life as we see it today, because the proteins are the machinery of life, in some sense coincidentally. That is his idea. And he has essentially put together over the last 25 years an amazingly compelling story about this. So he has found tons of these examples. He's essentially going example by example to really prove in terms of doing the structures, doing the computational biology, the entire story of all of these events. It's just compelling and amazing and, and very convincing to tell the story that in fact what we see today is just a random event of nature that RNA needed some help. And that created the protein universe. Uh, again, this is all an assumption, but one that makes more and more sense. In terms of the information content, you know the flow, you know that there is RNA today, so it's completely inverted. That this is how life historically started, but in terms of the information flow today, information is stored in the DNA, sort of transferred as an intermediate step into RNA and turned into protein. Again, the immediate, intermediate step uh, is, of course, the dent in the picture. Here, RNA is not only an intermediate step. In fact, there are ribosomes uh, that are full of uh, RNA, non-coding RNA. There are short RNA signals. What I mean by short is typically a ballpark of 20 nucleotides that are sRNAs, they are regulators, they are put on, on proteins, they regulate whether the protein, on the gene to regulate whether the protein is switched on or not, and also put on, on proteins to activate some processes or not. How many are there? So if I, if I looked at uh, human, how many proteins do we have in human? No answer? Ballpark. Plus minus a, a thousand, I don't care. We actually don't know. <laughs> yeah? Isn't the upper limit like 30,000? Oh, upper limit is, I don't know. They well, well, are, it's it's like if you're looking at what do you consider different proteins? Exactly. Like it's a real spices. problem. So, ex exactly. If you look at transcripts, yeah. so people will talk about 100,000 and more. So they are, they, they, the numbers go up to 300,000, but I believe sort of transcripts, the, the feeling is it's about 100K. Uh, when we talk about genes, most likely that number is sort of a ballpark 40. When we talk about proteins, that number is ballpark 20. And that brings us up to, to, the, to this question. What's the difference between 20 and, and 40? Why would we talk about 20 proteins, 20,000 proteins? We talked about roughly 37,000 genes. What's the difference? And ultimately the answer of that difference is Hello, 20,000, what is in there? Yeah? I was thinking about maybe a single nucleotide is the difference. Single nucleotide? Oh, variants. Uh, no. So it's not. Uh, but then I would. Uh, so when I talk about 20,000 proteins, then essentially I talk about 20,000 proteins. If you have a variant to them, I don't call them the same protein any. Well, in the same protein. No, I'm not talking about when, you, when I get older and my proteins are changing and now I suddenly have 22,000 proteins because most of those are confused what, about what they are. No, this is, <laughs> this is not the part I'm talking about. No, no, no. We really have uh, 20,000 proteins roundabout and another sort of 20,000 other things. What are these other things? Yeah, exactly. Well, this is quite obvious, right? Uh, and this is sort of the, the first time I believe this was really shown in an experimental paper uh, now 15 years, roughly 14 years ago. And for mouse in the Phantom Consortium, uh, I should have had the first author, uh, it's not in here, uh, where they looked at 180,000 transcripts from mice leading to roughly 16,000 proteins, so overall mouse has about 20,000 like human. Uh, 5,000 of those, this is a single, it is science, but it's a single paper, and in this single paper they added 5,000 proteins to the ditch, dish of what was known at the time. Uh, but the major point of this entire story in this point is, and this is uh, missing on this one here, um, non-coding, so non-proteins is in that same ballpark. Uh, 
So this paper showed that you have long RNA, so not the 20 nucleotide variant, so things that are 100 nucleotides long. So things that build, we know, build the ribosomes. Things that build the major bodies of the machine, but we had not known that there are that many. 20 or 16,000 at that point, they, at 15 or 16,000, I can't remember what the publication had. Uh, so essentially overnight they completely changed the view on what RNA, the variety of RNA that we need. We still don't know quite, for 14 years later, we still don't quite know what do we need that variety for. How much redundancy is in there? How much of those could we sort of get rid of? Unclear. But it is certainly, a, again, in human, this is about the 17,000, 20,000 protein, 17,000 non coding RNAs, makes up 37,000 genes. That's roughly what we believe today. Proteins, again, the transcripts we are talking about essentially are variants of these, these proteins mostly. There could also be variants of the, uh, of the, of the RNA coding, but most of those would be pro uh, variants of the proteins. Yes? Does alternative splicing happen with RNA? Uh, not like that, but actually, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't believe so. But why not? Yeah, Is alternative splicing happens exactly? Uh, I do not know. I do not know. Uh, homework for next time. So anyway, RNA is not an intermediate step, but for the course of this lecture we will treat it as such. We will just pretend that the major thing we want to do for predicting function is predict protein function from sequence. That's essentially the, the objective. And that brings us to this question, what is function? Here is protein functioning on different levels. Uh, that brings us back to, to this issue, what is a protein? Protein, what is protein function? Let's just dissect this word and first ask what is a protein before we ask what is function. What is a protein? Yeah? It's a chain of amino acids. This is sort of the, the simplest thing you can say and ultimately it's the only thing you can say. So uh, once you are beyond that simple thing, there's actually not much more we can say So as, as far as the definition goes. So this idea in a genome that it is a particular position in the genome, right? It's not true. I'm going to show you examples of proteins that are spliced together from different regions of the genome. Not only, I'm going to show you the HPAs at one of the next slides, they spliced together from different chromosomes, completely far apart as one protein. So why is that not, well, it's a protein. It's is done as one unit, it lives as one unit, as is called coda, whatever. Ultimately, sequence is the only clear way of defining it. The problem, of course, with sequence is what if you remove the methionine here? Or the serine at the, den at the end? Isn't that still? What if you change that? That was your idea, uh, Claudia. Just, you, you change the E against the Q here. Is that still the same protein? And that sort of be begins to get complicated. Uh, but ultimately the answer then is a new, to say is the new protein would be a fair way of putting it. And to, to define essentially by the hash of the protein sequence you define a protein. This is a completely valid way of doing it. And from this protein this is also valid because we know from uh, Anfinsen's experiments we know that all you need as input is the protein sequence to predict protein structure and ultimately function. We know the protein structure is sort of on a variety variety of scales, a variety of levels. Here are different protein structures shown. Here are channels, even bigger constructs of protein structures. Another question, of course, is if I had the sequence for a particular species, peppermint, and I had another sequence, oops, this goes in a different direction, this slide, than I expected. Uh, so this is the point that I made before. The ATPase is a big giant construct that is spliced together from different chromosomes, acts as one unit. Here is the complicated assembly of units uh, that are sort of put together in order to form one thing that we consider as the ATPase synthase, as one protein. In terms of function, there is a variety of thing you can, things you can say about it. It sits in the membrane. Is one aspect. Uh, you can say that it is 
doing something by binding to ADP or by using ADP. So it's something that is sort of energy driven as an operation. The operation that it does do is you see the shape here in purple and you see this big mushroom on top and ultimately this, this thing in, in, in purple is like two twisted wires and the big mushroom on top is like a handle and with this handle you turn you turn this, this, this wire around, right? And you, you know that if you sort of have a big handle and you want to sort of push pressure on this small thing, you have to turn a little bit here to have a high pressure down there. And what you can do with it, you can drill a hole. And that's exactly what it does. And there's another way of describing what it does. Uh, here sort of is, is a biochemical way of describing what it does. And then you can describe what it does in terms of rate of ions it pumps. Oh, uh, potassium, sodium. So there's a variety of ways of saying this is the function of that molecule and it brings together from sequence to this assembly to the action is not, not a direct path, right? Uh, so most of what we will do, we'll have to do in this semester with looking at the sequence and sort of saying, okay, it binds ADP, it sort of binds a, an ion or something like that. What is the binding side? And that will also be about the exercises. The molecular function is the way you see that. What is it that it binds? And on that level, when you look at homology-based inference, if you, if you knew here for the protein from spermint, the sequence, and you found the sequence from peppermint, and you compare it by alignment methods, these two sequences, you may say that they are similar enough so that you can say, if I know this is a cytochrome P450, this is also a cytochrome P450. By the way, P450 is one of these very ancient uh, enzymes that we believe is, was around uh, 500 million years ago already. Um, so homology-based inference says this is a cytochrome p 4 50 in peppermint. And that essentially means that from the sequence you can infer some aspect of function and this aspect of function typically are the molecular aspects. It binds something similar. It's the same kind of enzyme. Uh, how would you define function? So how can you define protein sequence similarity? Well, you can say there's a there's percentage sequence identity. You can say there's an E value from blast alignments. You know that. Uh, there are other ways in which you can do that, but those are very simple, well-defined ways. You can define structures by defining them in 3D, looking at the difference of every set of coordinates. RMSD, root mean square deviation, is one. How can you look at the similarity between function? Yeah? Can you look at the inputs and the outputs? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so, okay. Like what, what do you call input? Like Proteins interact with something always, and I look, what, what does it interact with? What happens to it? That's a good idea. So, uh, in, out, P. So you think about it like a chemical formula. Okay. Yeah? Can you tell about the proteins conformation chains? So, I'll entirely show how to do that. Uh, but, but say uh, the P doesn't fit to the in, but if the, well, I, I really, if the P becomes the shape like that, the in sits in there or something like that. Uh, so essentially, in that sense, the function, or one aspect of the function of the protein is to open up and adopt to essentially make this binding of in happen. Yes, that is clearly an aspect of function. It still is sort of described, if you want, it's described by this formula, right? You, you, in your point, you go uh, into detail of how that actually happens. So while the initial proposal was this reaction happens, what you now say is how it happens, okay? Which is still not invalidating the, the reaction. You're going in detail level. Uh, is there anything else you can say? Yes? Maybe localization? So, oh, we should put that under in. Let's let's call it where. Yeah. Uh, so where does it happen? Uh, so why would you care whether that particular chemical reaction happens, for instance, in neurons or in uh, blood? 
It may have different effects. Why may it have different effects? Well, 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 why, why, why could, could... So, uh, why could it be that if we had the same chemical reaction, the same in and out reaction, why could it be that there's a difference between that reaction in a blood cell or in a neuronal cell? Be part of a completely different pathway. So it could be part of it. So certain reaction that is part of different pathways. So why would that matter? So uh, where is uh, localization? Uh, and there's pathway. Where could also be pathway? These could be. So where could be pathway? But in pathway, typically, what I what I sort of think about is how a protein interacts with another protein, which in fact could if you sort of have that in a big sense, this could be the input protein, uh, one protein, uh, a protein X, this could be protein P, so this could be describing a pathway too, right? Could be an element of a pathway, but then to say, well, this is the pathway that digests sugar, or this is the pathway that digests alcohol, where the chemical reaction still is the same maybe, but it has different functional roles. And maybe in particular cells, it could be that one is done and the other cells, the other one is done because of the function of the cell. That could be one explanation that has happened. What else could it be? Why in different cell types? Uh, why could it be that in, in one cell, the protein uh, binds a certain substrate IN and in another one, it binds the substrate LN? Why could that happen? What's so in some sense we are back, you, you answer exactly the question that is back to your point here. Uh, because in what is around it, oh, what did you mean by what is around it? But, um, what is the, the medium that it... Yes, that? so that is what I thought you meant. Uh, so it could be that in fact according to, so in particular cell types, the medium in which it is, the pH value is slightly different. So that means the protein could be more open in one medium than in another. And it could be that being more open is essential to bind in. And if you're less open, all you can bind is LN. And in a different cell, the pH value is such that it only can bind LN. Right? This is exactly the right answer. But it could be something else. That is true. But there's something else that could happen. Why could it be that you observe the interaction between P1 and P2 in, uh, in say, in blood? and between P1 and P3 and in, in liver and not in blood. Yeah? What happens if, I mean, that uh, in blood you don't have P3 and in liver you don't have P2? As simple as that. Which brings me back to the question. We have, I don't know, we have 170 cell types or something in the ballpark of 200 cell types. Uh, we have 20,000 proteins. How many of those are expressed in all cell types? Almost none. Uh, there, there, are, there are some. But there are some, no, I'm sorry, of course there are some. But, but there are some, but, yeah. but it's a small number, so it's uh, several thousand. Okay. Uh, so that depends a little bit how you look at it, but you know, the number is sort of five, six, is, is not a bad idea for that. Uh, but when we look at these 100 or 200 cell types, how many proteins are expressed in a cell type, typically? Again, there's a big variety here, variance in the number, but I have an idea about ballpark. More than 5,000, I guess. She said 5,000. That's, a, that's, a, that's exactly the kind of answer that I want. So that's the first step. Put that down, right? That's the minimum point. And less than 20,000. Yeah. So now we have to pick a number between these two. Any idea? It's, it's sort of ballpark 10, 12, in that ballpark. Some, uh, so neuronal cells have 14 e expressed. Uh, the lowest number, I believe, is sort of 9 or 10. Uh, that, that sort of roughly is, is the, the range of things. So it is very easy to imagine that this P3 is not in some cell types, right? Uh, which, in fact, again, influences very much the interaction in the sense of pathway beyond 
or I'm not entirely sure whether it's beyond, uh, but may not be specific to the type of function a cell does. It's just that you know that set of proteins is not essential and maybe you have to do the same pathway in two different cell types but you have to do it with different proteins because those are just not available, right? This, this, this does happen. Uh, okay, so if I have this, so I have, I'm where, I have a pathway issue and I have a how, let's call that sort of the way of binding. Uh, so I have two, two, three, two, three, sorry, two, three different aspects. How do I unify them into a definition of what is protein function? Have you ever heard attempts to define protein function? Is anything coming to your mind if I say define protein function? E C codes. E C codes. That is a, and you say that because. I've worked a bit with them in my digital thesis. Okay. EC codes. I will get to them in a minute. Uh, any other buzzword? And again, you don't need to understand what EC code is. I'll, 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 I'll flash it in a moment. Go is something else, people. Let me flash that. But here is another answer to the question how you define function. You define function as, and here we have, in fact, in the so called EC number, again on the next slide, it's more detail on that. Uh, you have a bunch of descriptors that describe all of these three aspects. And one way of thinking about the protein function prediction is you devise a machinery that takes something, or writes an abstract like that from sequence. And this is something that is a challenge that we actually have not addressed yet as a field. This is something that we should actually do. And we should find ways of sort of text analysis to look at the similarity of function by essentially the, the similarity of text. Of, uh, but we haven't really addressed, I believe the field is ripe enough for this, but nobody has stepped up to doing that challenge. It's not as trivial as it sounds. Uh, it's a little bit wild. Anyway, let's get back to the C number from Curva. Uh, so enzyme, enzyme classification number uh, is a hierarchy of numbers, four digits. The first digit is sort of the major class. There are six different major classes. One of those six happens to be the first is oxyreductase. So it binds an, uh, uh, an O2 and reduces essentially the molecule, takes out an oxygen. Uh, not an O2, an oxygen. Uh, the second one is what is the group of donors, then we get into more detail and even more detail. So the further down in the scale, first more coarse grained, last number, most detailed explanation of what that enzyme does. The way this definition is done is essentially by experts looking at all the publications on a particular enzymes and coming up, bless you, uh, come, coming up with this classification scheme. It's been around since the 60s. Ultimately, underneath this is exactly your idea of input, output, the protein in between, which is essentially the chemical function or the chemical formula, right? Uh, that's sort of a way of putting this chemical expression here into words. Um, and that essentially is, is the number for that. Uh, and this happens to be 1.1.1 in this particular case, ADH. Uh, Acodihydrogenase uh, is the name of this protein. That's the other thing. Uh, the acodihydrogenase is in fact part of a pathway. Sorry for the quality. The pathway is from the pathway database keg. Uh, and each one of these here is, an, uh, is a protein. So you see this is a pathway for the alcohol deg uh, degradation that includes many enzymes. Here we have another example of function, uh, HIF, uh, from, from this year's Nobel Prize in Medicine. Uh, the at low oxygen level, uh, HIF, one alpha, is not degraded. It accumulates in the nucleus um, and binds to another protein here and that sort of uh, creates an, a specific pathway that then leads to degradation. Under normal circumstances here, normal level of oxygen, 
the HIF is rapidly degraded and in fact the, o, the oxygen regulates this degradation sort of as a self-supporting circle uh, it binds to the protein VHL here and that induced binding is in fact leading to an oxygen dependence so more oxygen more degradation of that protein so if you have at normal levels, the protein essentially is degraded. If you have un not enough, the protein is not degraded and is starting to sort of express all kinds of proteins that help you to deal with the situation where you don't have enough oxygen. We already have a situation where the protein does two different things in two different compartments. So localization where you are is essential in order to make the point, so again, this is all triggered by, by different levels of oxygen, uh, but in this particular case, even if you won't measure, uh, measure the oxygen levels, all you need to know is where in the cell uh, the protein is to know which pathway in this particular case is activated. If anybody feels cold, tell me. Uh, now, from the perspective of a biologist, what is function depends actually what they really care for. So if you're more caring about the chemical aspects, pharmacology, or then you want to know sort of how the structure looks, how the protein bi or the atom binds. On the biochemical level, you want to know this is actually an enzyme as a transferase or oxidoreductase. On the cellular level, you want to sort of know whether it's part of a certain process cell cycle, for instance. On a developmental level, you essentially want to know when this protein is activated and what this activation is sort of triggering in terms of how this animal grows or how this creature grows. Uh, in a physiological level, you want to know whether it's related to a disease, to the organism, genetic, is dominant or recessive. You can now say, well, whatever you define as function depends on what you're caring for. Or you can say, well, I define as function everything that happens to or through a protein. Now, this is sort of taking all of these levels, finding a sort of a circle around it, and saying this is what I call function, anything that happens. But this is sort of not quite working because you are ignoring that these are three different levels. Location, pathway, and molecular function uh, are different things, and you cannot just sort of Put them all. This is a simple definition, but it doesn't mean much. Okay, uh, but anyway. So for the course of this lecture, somehow this is the driver, and in this driver, the focus will be on the molecular aspects, on things that you can really see how it binds. Where it, we will begin with where it binds. We will get into the how. We will not really talk a lot about pathways. Uh, again, here's an example from Ana Luisa Roda, uh, where leptins really have very completely, a leptin has a very, very different function depending on the cell types. Uh, in some it sort of regulates appetite uh, or makes you eat more, and in some other cells essentially it triggers the opposite. That leads to stories, uh, tales, this is, I'm not sure whether that still is published, it was originally published by uh, the Swissport group, uh, Vivian Gerritsen, and essentially it's a book f full of stories for a particular protein, proteins such as this one here, and I just recommend that you, you read some of these stories. It's just amazing to look at the stories, what particular proteins are doing, what they're important for, uh, and then that. And now, essentially, I'm sorry, uh, Let's go into this one. Uh, that is essentially back to what Claudia said initially. So do I count a protein that has a variant in the sequence? Do I count it as a different protein? Uh, in this particular example, so the mother of all variants is E6-2V, uh, which in a particular molecule leads to a disease. So what it means essentially at position 6 in the sequence, you have an E in the wild type protein. And in the disease one, you have a V. Okay? Uh, that's all that happens. And what, what that leads to is th that you essentially have an aggregation of the protein here in, uh, in what is leading to sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia. Uh, you can so, sort of see the image. So a single variant that leads to a structural change, that leads to a disease. Uh, and in fact, that is sort of the first such variant described initially by Linus Pauling in 49. Uh, and a lot of work has been done on this disease, on this. It's still a disease that, that many people have, in particular 
uh, in malaria-rich regions. Let's get back to that question. We have the example where one particular variant leads to a disease. How frequent is that? If I looked at all the samples of this type, how many would I get? I'm going to switch on the light again. Because of this light is like that. Probably not a lot because... If Give me a number. Hmm? Oh. Is it a lot 5 or is it a lot 500 or is it a lot 50,000 or what is a lot? Maximum of 20. <laughs> 20? <laughs> why? It's a nice number. 40, why, why didn't you say 42? But anyway, uh, yeah, maximum 42. 42. Why 42? Um, because it's not really that common because um, the amino acids are degraded. How do you call it? Yeah. I'm not entirely sure what you mean. What do you mean by uh, degraded? Um, like the, the last um, base does not sometimes does not change the amino acid. Ah, the, so you're talking about the genetic code. Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, but that does not mean that a particular, as it originally was called SNP or SNF, so a single nucleate variant, does not have an effect. So many of these nuclear variants have an effect. Some don't in terms of amino acids. So some are so-called silent. They don't change the amino acid that is coded first. And some do. Now I'm asking for the ones that do change the amino acid. Uh, yeah? I think they are in the... So there are more than 20. So there are more than 42. More than several, I think, more, several thousand, maybe yes. 10,000 to 100,000. Yeah. So 10,000 is, is oh. I'd argue, a little bit on the high end of it, but, but uh, that again depends on the level of detail of description that you want. But you certainly have in the ballpark of two to 3,000 where you have a lot of molecular descriptions and you can name a disease. Uh, well, whatever it is a disease. And so if somebody loses hair, you have a variant that loses hair, um, and maybe that is not really a disease, but if you're bold, then you don't like it and you're unhappy. So, but, so there's about several thousands of uh, things described that are single, singly caused by a single variant. Okay? And some of them are really bad diseases. Uh, and many of the famous bad diseases, uh, sickle cell anemia is one of those examples, uh, but there are many others typically referred to as rare diseases, almost most of the rare diseases of that type. And there are many of those around. Um, but there's another issue that I want to address here, and that's the issue of motion. So sequence determines structure, is essentially what this one says, and structure determines function. So why is motion relevant? So if I, yes, I'm sorry, um, structures, protein structure, so I take a sequence, I throw it into a solvent, I get a unique three-dimensional structure. But this three-dimensional structure is changing. It is wobbling. Okay? It is wobbling in all kinds of directions. So it is wobbling in terms of the amino acid side chains wobble. And is wobbling as in the imagine it like a, a rubber ball, a very soft rubber ball, and you put some pressure on it. For some times, it will do like this, and that is exactly what proteins do. Okay, how is that relevant for function? Maybe in the wobbling, something has to get in. So that's exactly what it is, and I'm going to show you some movies. And so here's the the first one uh, where you see. That the molecule, the substrate, in fact, is searching for its binding, and you see really it's sampling the places. Essentially, it's looking whether that one is nice or not, uh, whatever your association. But you do also see that in this process, the wobbling of the entire protein is absolutely needed. Uh, And then I really like it, but I, I, I'm not patient enough. It takes too long to, <laughs> to find its position. Actually, can you predict where it will go? And no, you cannot. That's the funny thing. Uh, and we can actually also not quite do that on a computer yet. Is that stochastically simulated, or is that uh, yes. 
that's in the molecular dynamics simulation where some movement is so there's stochastics on top of, of the movement that is possible by the constraints of the binding okay. so you put random uh, Brownian motion on top of that protein and the Brownian motion is exactly put in a way where uh, uh, inversely proportional to the uh, constraints you have at that position right? Uh, and so it, it docks ultimately at this point uh, and actually predicting this is not that easy uh, here is an example where this is water uh, this is the, the channel here this is from Marco Punta and Marco De Vivo uh, and in fact it lets the iron pass and you already see that the protein really holds the space such that really one iron after another has to st stick up and they go through one at a time. Unfortunately, you don't see how the first one goes in, but ultimately, so they will be a little, become a little bit narrower, and being a little bit narrower, the, the push from the water molecule that is uh, tied in here uh, will actually lead to it coming in. Uh, and then it will open again, and then this sort of next one will come in, and this will do one at a time. And you see that the size of the iron and the charge is really crucial to distinguish what type of iron goes through there. This is how proteins can distinguish uh, potassium from a kalium or something like that. Uh, okay, so here's a simulation uh, from D.E. Shaw. Uh, David, let's begin, that is David Shaw. Uh, and David Shaw builds, I'm not entirely sure, let me just this is from a keynote he gave at Washington in Seattle. There are more interesting things more recently. I'm not going to go through the animation, uh, but David Shaw builds molecular dynamic machines that are special purpose machines. Uh, Anton, one, two, I don't know which version they have at the moment. Uh, they do molecular dynamic simulations and they do, in fact, do these simulations to see. Um, and that can be used to do something that I showed before really to explain the docking. Uh, just look at it on, online. It's, it's really remarkable to see how the docking happens. That brings us to the last quick story that I want to uh, talk about. Uh, the entire idea of structure sequence determines structure, determines function. Motion is not a contradiction to that because in fact the structure determines where you're mobile and where not. And that was the answer to you. The constraints in that modeling of the first one that I showed, the random motion you put on top of the constraints. Constraints means uh, connections in the structure. So where you're more fixed because you have more binding inside of that protein, right? And more binding essentially residue I binds more than J, it binds J and K and L or something like that. Then it's more constrained than when I binds no other residue except for the ones ne immediately next to it, sequence next to it. Now that's the entire idea that upon structure you have an imprinted idea of motion. What? But all of that is order. Motion is possible given this order. There's random events or random motion on top of this order, right? And the order defines where you have more or less uh, random variant and where you can open more or less. Uh, what about this order? And that is this idea. You have an example of a peptide, a part of a protein here, that is completely disordered. What disordered means is you shine light, if you could. You cannot unreal proteins, but operationally, if you could shine light at two different time points, you would see two different things. Then it binds, the red one binds the blue one, and upon binding, it adopts this helical structure that you see. It adopts some ordered conformation. Now, if you sh were shining light on it at two different time points, you would always see the same thing. So now it's ordered. Okay? And this is what disordered regions do. And some of these disordered regions, in fact, do not adopt always the same structure. Uh, so they seem to be coded for always remaining disordered. So there are different types of disorder. And what we know is there are many more disordered proteins in eukaryotes and many more in mammals than in lower eukaryotes. And one assumption is that, in fact, disorder is one way to increase complexity. So why is that? Because a disordered region, you could imagine you could fit the same thing into two different shapes. That means with the same protein, you can bind two very different molecules, right? Um, and that somehow is the explanation that is on the table. Uh, let's get into matrix for protein function. I already talked about that. The function metric here 
Let's look at the example of the EC. How would you define a metric? Say all we wanted to do is define molecular function, this how, and we want to sort of, we have this EC classification, that is a hierarchy, and we have two different prediction methods. One predicts the number 4.1.3, and the other one predicts uh, 4.3.3. How do I measure how similar these two are? What's the metric? So I have a tree. Distance in the graph. Distance in a graph. Is that completely doing it? What do you assume then, if you, if you uh, did that? That each, or well, yeah, uh, let's say a weighted graph. Ah, now we're, getting, we're beginning to get complicated. Let's, let's everybody follow up to what, 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 what Paul is detouring. So first he says graph, distance in a graph. The important thing in, uh, for that is you have to assume that all graphs that you're going to have have the same width or the same, the same size. And Paul already realized immediately they will not have. Because the depth of detail here depends on the function. Now he said weighted. Weighted has two levels. Weighted has the level, this level should be weighted differently than the top level. And weighted should be level, uh, uh, the weight should be different between things that have a very detailed, wide tree and those that have a very narrow tree. But how do you do that? And we suddenly, you begin to see that something that's very, very, very simple. They have a tree. We want to simply compare how well you do on a tree and you can get many numbers, many answers for that. But the problem, the devil, is exactly in, the, in this detail that you keep many. And that means you cannot easily distinguish which one is right and which one is wrong. And that is one problem in this field of functional assessment of CAFA. So how could you try to do it? How do you believe CAFA does it? Just like any, any sort of approach in science. Forget about the tree. How would you do that? You want to see how well does your prediction method do? What can you compare yourself with? What's the minimal one you have to beat? Random. Yeah. So essentially you can create random predictions on a tree and then you can sort of do the next level. So how could you beat random? So you could beat random that if, if the tree is wider you predict more often, okay? Or the tree has more populated, or so you, there, there are certain roots that are more often, you use them more often. So you can, by sort of, let's call it cheating, influence your, your performance. And this is called a naive, or you can call that a naive classification method, right? Something that would be cheating is a simple prediction method, so you use numbers that are not really meaningful, because your prediction method, just by predicting whatever you have to have observed, have observed up to today more often, is not necessarily any value, right? But at least it is important to see whether your prediction method that you develop does more than that. Right? So in that sense, it's not random, but it's sort of an advanced random, or it's an advanced naive prediction. And this kind of thing you should always think about when you develop a method. Uh, First, measure it against random. And actually, even that is not that trivial. What is random? Uh, but sort of switching labels is one way of putting it. Uh, but on the next level, you should sort of come up with, a, with something that, that sort of you call a stupid method. Like, we're talking about you develop a method that predicts binding sites, okay, in the exercises. The data is 10% are binding sites, or 5 to 10% meaning that 90 to 95 percent of the residues are not binding. So you always predict non-binding, you're actually going to get a good accuracy. Because for most of the residues you predict, you have the right prediction. Total nonsense. Uh, but you have to see how your method compares to something like these total nonsense, you could call them naive predictions, right? Uh, and that's what people try in this field too. And I'm going to leave it right there. Thank you for your attention. I do go to